strengthen us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll take your Bibles now and turn with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. Beginning the looking at verse 56 and 57, the last two verses of this chapter, and then we'll go into chapter 42. I'm entitled this message, A Famine of Righteousness and a Storehouse of Salvation. A Famine of Righteousness and the Stores of Salvation. The scripture here reads in verse 56, And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. And we'll end there just a minute if you want to remember this then this history we have before us remember how God purposed he gave Joseph those visions that his family would bow down before him and you remember his brothers were so jealous they sold him into slavery and how that Joseph was uh, in Potiphar's house just so happened right just so happened he was in Potiphar's house just so happened that he was the best servant Potiphar had and then you remember he was put into prison and then by God's mercy, by God's design, Joseph rose up to, the, to be second only to Pharaoh in all the land of Egypt. And you remember he had that, Pharaoh had that dream, the dream of the, the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows. And that was a picture of what was going to happen. There were going to be seven fat years in Egypt. And then there were going to be seven lean years seven years of famine and it was God that purposed Joseph to store up all that grain for those seven fat years so that the that people that that they might live that they might have a storehouse of grain during this seven years of famine and Joseph was given rule over all this grain to give it out and now we see the purpose of God ripening here in our text we see the whole purpose of those fat years was to, and raising up of Joseph was this purpose. Listen in verse 2. Now, I want you to see the main purpose. Now, surely he did save a lot of people. Surely his storing up of all that grain saved Egypt. It saved most all the countries of that region at that time. But this is the main purpose. Now, when Jacob, saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why look you upon another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there's corn in Egypt. Now get down thither and buy for us thence that we may live and not die. You see, the main purpose of raising up Joseph was what? To save Jacob. To save Jacob. This is clearly seen when Joseph revealed himself. Remember when he reveals himself in chapter 45, he said, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, he purposed this, that God should save Jacob. And you know this, because Jacob was the, the line. It was Jacob's seed that by which Christ should come. Now, we know this history, as all history in the Old Testament has a purpose. It has a purpose not to teach us a history lesson. The purpose is that we might see the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these things, Paul said, were a pattern, a pattern concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember one preacher when I first began to preach, he said, when you stand up to preach, remember this, you always preach the four R's. Ruin, redemption, regeneration, resurrection. Always in every message, because that's the gospel, isn't it? We always preach man's ruin, Christ's redemption, the Spirit's regeneration, and the coming resurrection. We preach these things every time we preach the gospel. This morning it won't be any different. It won't be any different. That's my whole design this morning to preach the gospel. So 
What is true in this type is also true in the real, for the Scriptures, as in all the Old Testament, shows forth Christ and His salvation of the elect. Now, let's see the type here. First of all, I want you to see the famine. What is this famine? Let us see that this famine is meant as a type and picture of a greater famine. A greater famine that is spread throughout the whole world as a result of sin. And that is, listen, the famine of righteousness. There's a famine of righteousness. Just as this seven years, there was no food. The earth yielded no food. Even so, man by nature can yield no righteousness. No righteousness. A famine. Now, what is a famine? A famine is, is, is a desolate place. It's a place where there is no growth, there is no life. And see that wherever sin is, there is a famine of righteousness. And the result of no righteousness is what? The same as a result of a famine. It's death. If there is no food, what? There's death. Even so, more importantly, if there is no righteousness... There is death, eternal death. The Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 14, Follow peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? They shall see God. You see, there's no hope of you standing before God except you are holy, except you are righteous. In the end, when God wraps this thing up and there's heaven, what do you suppose heaven is going to be like? Heaven's going to be a place without sin. Without sin. In Revelation 21, he's describing the kingdom. He said, There shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, or whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh the lie, but only they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is the only people that will be there. Holy people, those written in this book. Only the righteous shall see God. Only the pure of heart shall see God. Only those who are holy shall be accepted of God into His kingdom. And yet we know the Word of God, and by our own experience, testifies against us that there is a famine of righteousness in our own heart in our nature. You know, even the Apostle Paul said this of himself, who was a saved man, who, who no doubt will inherited the kingdom prepared by Christ. Yet he says of his own nature, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. Now, we live in a country where we don't know anything about famine. I, in my in my experience in this life, I have not experienced famine in this land. Have you? Even the poorest of this country, we, we don't really know what real poverty is in this country. And most people, if they're impoverished, usually they just don't go, they're, they're too lazy to go down to the government and get a check. I mean, because there's just, they're just too much being given out uh, to not have food. And we have food galore. We don't know much about famine. We know a lot about prosperity, don't we? This country is very prosperous. But let me ask you this. When does prosperity, prosperity might produce food, but prosperity never produces righteousness. In fact, it produces the opposite of righteousness. Being prosperous in this thing, in this world, does that make people grateful? Are people in this country grateful to God for the things we have? No. No. Are we drawn closer to God because we are prosperous? Are we more righteous? Matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 2, it says, you know, that Israel was so prosperous. He said, that this country is so prosperous, but the more they have silver, the more gods they have. You know that? 
The more prosperous a land is, the more gods they have, the more false gods they produce. So prosperity doesn't yield righteousness. In fact, prosperity have only made men more bold in their rebellion. You know, isn't that what it, Solomon said? He said, because a, uh, judgment is not executed speedily, it emboldens men to be more wicked. And this relig the religious of this world, you know, they have, men have the same heart as that church of Laodicea, don't they? When everything's going well, what do they say? Well, we are rich and increased of goods and have need of what? Nothing. We well, don't need anything. But what's the truth? The truth is you are blind, you are lame, you are poor, you are naked. That's the truth. Why? Because by nature there's a famine of righteousness in our hearts. There's a famine of righteousness in the nature of man. We may not have a famine of food, but I tell you there is a famine of righteousness. And outward prosperity does not expose the famine, rather it just increases the deception. The more we have in this world, the more the natural man has in this world, the, more, the less he needs righteousness. Or thinks he needs, less he needs righteousness. But you know what? Let a man plow and plant righteousness all he wants to. That's what religion does, isn't it? Isn't that what they're laboring for? They're laboring in their religion trying to plant righteousness by their works. They plow and they plant that by their religious obedience. But let a man labor and be as good as he can. Let him study as much as he can. Let him learn doctrine as much as he can. Let him pray as earnestly as he can. But whatsoever he plants and sows in the barren desert of his heart, he will not yield righteousness. Now they think they will. They think they do. Our Lord in Matthew chapter 25, when he separates everyone and he puts the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left hand, he says to those goats, he said, depart from me, you work iniquity. I... You know, when I was naked, you, you, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And what do they say? Lord, when did we not do that? They still in that day will believe that their righteousness, that their good works were sufficient to be accepted of God. And he says to them, Depart from me, you that work with iniquity. I never knew you. That's because they failed to see the famine of righteousness in their hearts, that they could by no means please God. Friends, I want to tell you that the ruin of man was perfect. Perfect. You know these seven lean years? Seven is number of perfection, isn't it? This famine pictures man's ruin and it's perfect. What does that mean? There is no hope of you ever earning salvation. It was a perfect fall, a complete fall. But I want you to notice this in the second thing here about this famine. Jacob also was in the midst of this famine. Look at this. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why you look one upon one another? Notice this in this text, that God's chosen man, Jacob, did not escape the famine. Did not escape the famine. Jacob, in Scripture, we know he was chosen. The Scripture says in Romans 9 that the children not yet being born, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. It is said to her, the elder shall serve the younger as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You see, God loved Jacob before Jacob was born. He was chosen of God before the foundation of the world. And you remember that the promise of Christ was to come through who? Jacob. He said to Isaac, 
In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He was talking about Jacob. Through Jacob should Christ come. He was a blessed man of God. It was God's purpose through Jacob that Christ should come and redeem Israel. But now look at this condition. Jacob is in a low condition, this chosen man of God, and see how that he was in the same condition as the rest of the world. He was starving to death just like everyone else. And so now then see the reality of the picture is this, that God before the famine of sin, God in sovereign mercy chose a people of which Jacob is a type, a picture. And as God loved Jacob before his birth, not according to his merits, but according to free grace, even so God loved his elect people and put them in Christ before the foundation of the world. This is the doctrine of election. What a wonderful doctrine this is. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. He said, but of God. Are you in Christ this morning? Who put you there? But of God are you in Christ Jesus. Who of God, purposed of God, is made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Surely this, was, this is what is pictured by those seven fat years, isn't it? Perfect salvation. When was this perfect salvation stored up? Well, it was stored up before the famine, wasn't it? Before there was a famine of righteousness, guess what? Righteousness was stored up in Christ for all the elect. For Jacob. This is Joseph stored this up for Jacob. Christ stored this up for his people. When? Before the famine. <laughs> Before sin entered into the world. This was stored up in Christ. This righteousness and salvation was stored up in Christ from eternity. God had stored up this grain of salvation in Christ. Therefore, as Jacob was under the famine of sin... Even so are all of the elect born under this famine. We are all born under sin. Dead in sin. Yet here, God shows us that He makes the difference. Who made the difference between Jacob and Esau? God made the difference. Who made the difference between Jacob and the rest of the world? God made the difference. God in grace and in power made the difference. Now, how could you tell the difference between Jacob and the rest? Listen, Jacob felt his need. Jacob felt his need. Jacob knew his need that if he did not have grain, what? He would die. He didn't sit there and say, well, I'm God's chosen. <laughs> I know that in me, through my seed, that all the families of the earth shall be blessed, so I'm going to sit here and grain will come to me. That's not how it happened. <laughs> no, he felt a need. He felt a need. A lot of people say, well, if I'm God's elect, He's just going to rain it down. I don't have to hear the gospel. I don't have to do anything. I don't need to go search him out. He'll, he'll, no, that's right. He'll find you if you're his, but that's not how anybody is found of him, is it? Is that how you were found? No. God made you see your need. If you're ever one of God's elect, you're going to know your need. And Jacob here, he says, look, we're going to starve to death. But, listen, I heard something. I heard there's corn in Egypt. I heard there's corn in Egypt. So look at that. He says this. He saw that there was corn in Egypt. He said to his sons, why do you look one another? And he said, behold, I have heard there's corn in Egypt. Now what? Get down there. 
get up off your rear and go. We got to have this corn. Get down there that we may live and not die. Can you see that picture? They're sitting around looking at each other. <laughs> starving to death. They're starving to death looking at one another. Isn't this how religious men do it? They're starving to death for righteousness and they're looking to each other to fill it. Listen, I can't give you righteousness. Don't look at me. And I won't look at you. It ain't going to do no good. You're just as wicked as I am. Now you put on the robes and you, you can have all the, the pomp and circumstance and you can have all the rings on your fingers and you can have millions of people bowing down to you. You're just as wicked as I am. You need what I need. Righteousness. And we can't give it to each other. Can't give it to each other. And men will do this, they'll keep doing this unless God makes them feel the barrenness of their soul. Unless they know the depravity of their own heart. And how will they know except they hear there's corn in Egypt? They would have sat there and died had they not heard the message. Listen, men by nature need righteousness and how do they know they need it except someone come and tell them where it's found where it's found this is what we do we preach the gospel faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god and this is the message we preach that those elect of god those who are under the famine of sin we say this behold christ is the bread of life. Christ is the bread of life. Come, you hungry. Isn't that what the scripture says in, in Isaiah 55? It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. What are we going to do when we get there? We'll, we'll buy. What are we going to buy? We're going to buy wine. We're going to uh, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk. Well, I ain't got no money. Good, because it doesn't cost you anything. Without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and labor for that which satisfied not? Hearken diligent to me and eat ye that which is good. Christ is good. You found that true? You found he's good? There's no bread like this bread. There's no bread that will satisfy like this bread. This bread gives me righteousness. This bread gives me peace with God. This bread gives me redemption and cleansing from all my sins. This bread gives me life. There's no bread like this bread. This bread's been stored up for eternity. And he says, come and eat. Come without money, without price. Come now and hear this gospel that God purposed salvation to Jacob. God has chosen a people and praise God for this message, because if he had not chosen any, none would come. People, people that, that mock against election do not understand depravity. They don't understand the desperation of man's ruin. If God had not chosen a people, none would come. We would all die of starvation, of righteousness. Praise God he did. Now, who are these elect? Well, they're people who feel their need of bread. <laughs> they're hungry people. Are you hungry for righteousness? Are you tired of that which doesn't satisfy? See, it does not satisfy. It does not satisfy. Christ satisfies. Christ is the message. He has perfect righteousness, perfect redemption. In Isaiah 45, God said this, Picturing him as Joseph, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight and break into pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. Isn't that what he did? He went before us, ahead of us, making the path plain, clear. See, it was by grace that we were put into Christ and given 
to be His elect, and all spiritual blessings were given to us in Christ. And God has chosen us, had purposed that we should be holy, that we should not be barren. That's what God purposed. He said, I purposed you should not starve to death. There's a famine. God's people are under it. But God says this of His people, you won't starve to death. You know why? I went ahead of you. I stored up righteousness for you. I stored up salvation for you. And you know what? There are no bars. <laughs> and nothing's stopping you. Isn't that something? There's nothing stopping a man from coming to Christ. Nothing. Nothing. And so he makes the desert wilderness like rivers of water. Fruitful. Are you such a sinner? Are you in such a famished place? Then listen. There's bread in Egypt. <laughs> Christ went ahead and stored up salvation. Come. Isn't that what he said? Isn't the scripture so inviting? Listen, if you wait till you're better, you won't come. I mean, if, if you're sitting there starving to death, you say, well, you know what? I'm going to wait till I feel a little bit more full before I come. Isn't that silly? That's just stupid, isn't it? <laughs> Who would say that if they're starving to death? No, come to Christ. Now notice this, the reception that Jacob's family received. Now they get down there and they come to Egypt and they're going to buy some corn. Now they got a bunch of money now. They got some money. They want to buy it. And uh, that's not going to work out too well for them. Look at what happens in verses 5 of, the second, of this chapter 42. He said, and The sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, and the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was governor over the land, and he that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren. He knew them, but made himself strange to them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, We come from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them and said unto them, You are spies. To see the nakedness of the land are you come. And they said, no, we, Lord, we came to buy food. We're your servants. We are man, one of, of one man's, uh, we are all one man's son. We are true men, servants and no spies. But he said to them, no, but you are, you are to, but to see the nakedness of the land are you come. He spake roughly unto them. He didn't know them. He didn't, uh, she, they didn't know him, but he knew who they were. When we come to Christ, we don't know who he is. <laughs> Listen, he knows who we are. He knows who we are. Isn't this our experience when we come seeking salvation with money in hand? Doesn't Christ speak roughly to us? He speaks roughly. He's like that Syrophoenician woman. Remember that? She came, Lord, begging. And Lord ignored her. And he turned around and said, Is it me to give the children bread to dogs? What was he doing? He was humbling her. What is he doing to these men? He's humbling them. He's bringing them to the low place. Isn't this what he does to all those who have need of salvation? He must bring us to to the end of ourselves. He must bring us. He speaks roughly. The law comes in and speaks roughly. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Curses everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Surely when we come to Christ with anything in our hands, he will surely speak roughly to us. Why? Because enough is never enough. You cannot earn this bread. You cannot earn this bread. Sinner, you and I must come to Christ empty and broken. That's what he's doing to his brothers. He's going to make them empty and broken. And then what? Gives them everything. <laughs> he gives them everything. But not till they're empty and broken first. That's how a man comes to Christ. He must be empty and broken. So Joseph could not reveal himself. 
to his brothers until he had first uh, crushed their pride and schemes. Joseph would try them. Now he gives them grain. He gives them grain. He said, you're going to go back. And uh, he said, uh, they told him about Benjamin. And Joseph, Joseph wants to see Benjamin, his brother. So he says, I'm going to keep one of you and I'm going to send the rest of you back. And you prove to me what you said. You bring back Benjamin with you, your youngest brother, so you can prove you're not spies. I'm going to keep one and the rest of you go back. And so he gave them this provisions to go back on their journey. Gave them everything they need. And he, what did he do with their money? Put it right back in their sacks. He didn't want their money. He didn't want their money. Put it right back in their sacks. And so they have to go back and get Benjamin. A sinner must come to Christ. I want you to know this. He must yield the most precious thing to Christ. He must sacrifice everything. What was the most precious thing Jacob had? It was Benjamin. Benjamin was the most precious thing that he had. And yet, what did Joseph demand of Jacob? He demanded Benjamin. He demanded he yield the most precious thing to him. When a sinner comes to Christ, he must come empty of his religion, empty of his works, and he must offer up everything to Christ. Jesus said, Whosoever forsaketh not all that he had, he what? Cannot be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. Therefore, you who are famished, listen, forsake everything. Forsake everything. Forsake your religion, your family, your friends, your health, your wealth, treasures, for you cannot have Christ and them. And surely, men will not forsake these things until they're brought to the end of themselves. Now, they get back with all this grain, and, and, and Judah says, look, we gotta, we're going to go back. We can't go without Benjamin. You're going to have to give us Benjamin, or we can't go back. And what do they do? Well, they eat all the grain that they have. He didn't send him back until every ounce of that grain was gone. And when it was gone, you remember he says, that, he says now you boys go back and get some more. Judah says, no. We can't. Go back without Benjamin. The man will not allow it. Man will not allow it. Jacob would not let Benjamin go to Egypt till they'd eaten everything. Jacob said that to his sons, he, he, go back. He said, no. And that's in chapter 43. If you go to chapter 43 and verses 1 through 5, that's when that happens. But something happens here between Judah and Jacob. And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass that they had eaten up all the corn which they had brought out of the land of Egypt. And their father said, Go again, buy a little food. And Judah spake to him, saying, The man so solemnly protest against us, saying, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Can you imagine the pain that Jacob faced at this point? The pain is a picture of one who is truly convinced of his sin. When a believer is convinced of his sin, he knows this, he knows this, he must give everything to have Christ. He must lay down his soul on Christ. One who knows his need but cannot bear to let go of what he holds precious. And yet here is the promise of God to all such sinners. It is the promise of Judah. It is the promise of Judah to Jacob. The promise of a surety. A surety. Look at verse 8 and 9. 
It says, And Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me. We will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee, set him before thee. Let me bear the blame forever. Sinner, listen to this. These are the words of Christ. These are the words of Christ as he promised the Father. I will be surety for thy beloved sons. Jesus says to the Father in a covenant promise, Father, all that you give me, I will return safely to you. And if I fail, let me bear the blame. That's what a surety is. One who guarantees. See what great promise the Son has promised and swore to the Father. I will be surety. You know what that means? I will be responsible for them. I will take all the responsibility for their salvation. And so when Jesus came into the world as a man, he came as what? A surety. He came as a surety, as a representative man, in order to accomplish salvation, in order to save Jacob, in order to save his little ones. He came as a surety. And by as our surety, he obtained both righteousness and and redemption. You can read about this in Romans 5. Romans 5 is a very clear explanation of what he came to do. Adam was a representative man. And when Adam sinned, all that were in him sinned. All, when he died, all of his posterity died. He was a representative. Paul says, even so Christ. By the disobedience of one many were made sinners even so by the righteousness of one shall many be made righteous that's what Christ came to do as a representative how then let me ask you this you that are weighing on this that do, will not give your soul to Christ listen was he successful was the surety successful did he fail was he discouraged? Religion would have us believe so. Religion would have us believe that Christ the surety died for all men and didn't save them. That some of those he died for, some of those he represented, will be in hell. That's not true. The Word of God tells us plainly of his servant in Isaiah 42 and verse 4, he says, He shall not fail nor be discouraged. When the angel came and, and spoke of his birth, he said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. In Hebrews 10, it tells us plainly, Hebrews 10, 14, He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This man, by his one offering for sin, forever sat down. Why? As a representative, Christ accomplished salvation. He accomplished it. Jesus declares himself that all that the Father gave him, he would lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. And so now look back to your text in verse 44, chapter 44, and look at verse 30. Now here, Judah being the representative, now bringing Benjamin. He says, okay, take Benjamin. There's no other way. And so he takes Benjamin there. And uh, you see, in verse chapter, uh, chapter 44, look at verse 30. He's talking to, uh, to Joseph here. And Joseph is saying, look, you know, he put, that, he put that silver cup in Benjamin's bag and he accused Benjamin of stealing. And he says, Benjamin's going to be my servant forever. Oh, that can't be. I'm surety for him. <laughs> I'm surety for him. And he said, look at verse 30. Now, therefore, when I come to, to thy servant, my father... And the lad is not with me, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, he shall 
die. And thy servant shall bring down great hairs of thy servant on our father with sorrow to the grave. I want you to see this. Jacob's life was bound up with Benjamin. It was bound up with Benjamin. If Benjamin did not come back, Jacob would die. And see then the reality of the picture. The glory of God is tied to the salvation of his people. The glory of God is tied to the success of Jesus Christ. If you read that in chapter 1 of Ephesians, how many times do you read to the praise of the glory of his grace? Isn't that why we were chosen? Isn't that why Christ came to save us, that we should be accepted in the beloved according to the praise of the glory of His grace. The glory of God is tied to the success of Christ. Just as Benjamin's life was tied to Jacob, even so God's glory is tied to the success of Christ. If God has promised to save His elect but fails to save them, the glory of God is darkened forever and God becomes a false god. Why? Because that's what God said false gods are. False gods, you see, they can't do anything. They don't have any power. Over in, uh, in, in uh, Isaiah, uh, I, chapter escapes me, God says of false gods, he said, he said, let them show me what happened before. Let them show me what's going to take place ahead. They can't because they're false gods. But what does he say about himself? The true God, he said, I've declared the end from the beginning. From ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now, if God's counsel is to save his elect and Christ failed, what happens to God? His counsel fails. And we know this. That won't happen. That won't happen. Therefore, if it was the pleasure of the Lord to save, and he fails, then he would be a false God, yet God hath uh, God hath committed all judgment to the Son. God has purposed that in Christ should all the fullness dwell. Why? Because God trusted Christ with all the souls of His people and His glory. He trusted Christ. What? As surety. He trusted Christ as surety with all his people. And see then in verse 33 and 34 that Judah was willing to substitute himself for Benjamin. Look at that in verse uh, 33. He says, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad as a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see evil that shall come upon my father? You see, Judah says, I am willing to substitute myself to be a servant for Benjamin. Can you not hear the voice of Christ in that? <laughs> Can you not hear the voice of our Savior? That he, as our surety, was willing to substitute himself to become a, what? Servant. Isn't that what he did? Isn't that what Christ did? He became a servant. And therefore, when he came, he said this, He hath opened mine ear. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 5, He hath opened mine ear. What does that mean? When the bondservant wanted to be with his master, he loved his wife, he loved his master, loved his children, they would take an awl and they'd bore a hole in his ear. And he would be his servant forever. That's what Christ said. He hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned my back. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that pluck out the hair. I hid not my face from spitting. That is, he was made a curse. He was made a curse. Willingly made sin for us. 
And he set his face like a flint, trusting God, knowing that his one sacrifice would forever put away our sins. Therefore, he laid down his life once as our substitute, as a payment for sin. And listen, God was forever satisfied. Now, how do we know this? Because he is risen. He's risen from the dead. Because there is no more sin to charge him. The grave could not hold him. And not only is he just risen, God was so pleased that he sat him on the throne of heaven. Do you realize there is a man in heaven? Who is he? He's a surety. He's our substitute. He's our representative. He's our high priest. He is Christ. And I want you to know this, that the names of his people are written on his hands and they can't be erased. They can't be erased. We like to sing this song, A Debtor to Mercy Alone. Of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with his righteousness on my person and offering to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. My name from the palms of his hands, eternity cannot erase. Impressed on his heart it remains with marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure, as sure as the earnest is given, more happy but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. Are you famished this morning? Do you need righteousness? I tell you, Christ, our Joseph, has gone before us and stored up all that God requires If you come with anything, surely you'll be sent back. And when God brings you to the end of your sales, what are you going to bring? You're going to give up your Benjamins. You're going to give up everything. Now what hope have you to lay your soul on Christ? Because he's a surety. If God first trusted in Christ, why should you not trust in Christ? <laughs> if God was satisfied with his offering, why would man not be satisfied with his offering? Why would you ever think you would need to bring more? He offered his blood that God required and God is forever satisfied. So come now and come, come empty. Come empty. And surely, if you will come, you will not die. You will not lack righteousness. In that song we just sang, if you tarry till you're better, You'll never come at all. May God even now make you, make your famine real. Uh, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't, <laughs> if you have any twinge of, of, of need of righteousness, I pray God makes it worse. Until you come to the end of yourself. And when you do, you'll come like these brothers. You'll be brought down to nothing. And when they were brought down to nothing, what happened? When they were at their rope end, at the end of chapter 44, there he is, he's, 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 he's laying it all out. I'm sure it's it. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be your servant. Look, I'm just going to be your slave. Let these go free. I'll be your slave. Look at what happened in verse 1 of chapter 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself. What did he do? He revealed who he was. 
Isn't this how we come to Christ? When we come broken and empty, what does he do? He cannot refrain himself any further. Like that prodigal son. We're out there in, eating the, eating the uh, husks and have no, no food. We come in, we say, oh, I'm going to confess. Father, I've sinned against thee and against heaven. And we're rehearsing this all the way. No, we've got nothing to offer. Rehearse it all the way. And we see him running. He runs to us. And what do we? Well, Father, I've sinned against thee. And shut up. <laughs> and he falls on his neck and he kisses him. He says, kill the fatted calf. That's my son who was dead is now. It's as though God is sitting on the edge of his seat waiting for his sons. Only time in scripture where God's in a hurry. When he sees his sons coming empty and broken. Nothing. Oh, one day I will truly feel the lips of my Savior kissing me, embracing me, seeing him face to face. And I know this, when a sinner comes, there's fear, isn't there? It's trembling. When we repent, isn't that the way we repent? Isn't that the way we're constantly coming to Him? Constantly being broken, constantly being confessing our sins. And isn't He constantly receiving us the same way? Revealing Himself. They're in fear. And you know, Joseph, he says this to his brethren. He says, uh, verse 4, he says, Come near to me, I pray you. In chapter 45. And they came near... He said, I'm Joseph, your brother, that you sold. Now, therefore, be not grieved or angry with yourselves. Oh, my. How can I not be grieved with myself? How can I not be angry with myself? Look what I've done. I've sold you. I've killed you. Don't be angry with yourselves. Why? Don't be angry, you sold me. For God did send me before you to preserve life. And he said, look, only two years this famine's here. There's still five more years. What is he talking about? We still living in this famine, aren't we? <laughs> there's still a famine around us. Now God has given us Goshen. God provides food for us daily. And yet what? There's still a famine around us. And so what are we to do here? We're to constantly preach the word to those in the famine. Listen, there's bread in Egypt. There's a storehouse of salvation. I can imagine these big granaries <laughs> just full, full of, of grain. And you just eat and eat and eat and it never goes out. That's the mercy of God. You can eat on Christ all the time and it never goes out. His mercy endureth forever. But I've seen His mercy endureth forever. But I'm not sufficient. His mercy endureth forever. You can just keep eating. And then we, we tell others. We need to tell others. There's a storehouse full of mercy, full of righteousness, full of peace, full of pardon. Why? Christ went before us. Christ went before us. Oh, that God would feed you even today with his mercy and his love with Christ. Our Father, I pray you'd use the message as you please. My prayer is that it, that it honor thee. 
that it exalt Christ. Oh, that you would feed your little ones today, that we might have peace and joy and contentment, that we might go about our Father's business in this world, believing and loving one another as Christ loved us. Forgive us our sins in Jesus' name.